hi everyone and thank you for joining the Constitutional Law Institute's inaugural Constitution Day conversation. I'm Libby Seguin, the new manager of the Institute. Professor Bode is the faculty director. We hope this Constitution Day conversation becomes a yearly event here at the law school with obvious goals of it being in person next year. The Constitutional Law Institute is a new research center here at the law school. The Institute will highlight faculty research, will hold events, speakers, and conferences in the future, and we have exciting plans to host a podcast this upcoming year. While we are working on getting our website up and running, we are that new, please follow us on Twitter at UChicagoConLaw. Our future events will be posted on our website, but for the time being, please check the Law School's events page for future events. If you have any ideas or suggestions for events, topics, or speakers, please reach out to myself or Professor Bode. We have three great speakers here with us today, and I'm honored to introduce them. The first is William Bode. He is a professor of law and Aaron Director Research Scholar here at the law school. He teaches federal courts, constitutional law, and conflicts of law. He received his bachelor's in mathematics from the University of Chicago, and his JD from Yale Law School. He then clerked for then Judge Michael McConnell on the United States Court of Appeals and Chief Justice John Roberts Jr. on the US Supreme Court. Before joining the Chicago faculty, he was a fellow at the Stanford Constitutional Law Center and a lawyer at Robbins Russell. Next, we are thrilled to welcome Farah Peterson. She is a legal historian who focuses on statutory interpretation. She holds a PhD in American history from Princeton University. She earned her JD from Yale Law School and received her bachelor's in history from Yale as well. After law school, she clerked for Associate Justice Stephen Breyer on the US Supreme Court and Judge Guido Calabresi on the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Previous to joining the law school, Farah was an associate at Jones Day, an associate law professor at University of Virginia School of Law and was a visiting professor at Georgetown University Law Center. Last, please give a warm welcome to Stephen Zacks. Stephen is a professor of civil procedure, constitutional law, and conflicts of law at Duke Law. He clerked for Chief Justice John Roberts Jr. on the U.S. Supreme Court and clerked for Judge Stephen Williams on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. He then practiced in the litigation group at Mayor Brown before joining the faculty at Duke Law. Stephen received his bachelor's degree from Harvard. He was a Rhodes Scholar graduating from Oxford University and received his JD from Yale Law School. I will now turn it over to Professor Bode. Uh, thank you, Libby. Thank you everybody for coming. <clears throat> so this is our first uh, event, so to speak. And uh, I'm really excited to have uh, Steve and Farah, both of you here, joining us. Uh, the, in addition to the fact that you're two of my favorite constitutional law scholars, uh, one thing that brings all three of us together is an interest in, I guess, what we'd call the law of constitutional interpretation. The idea that there could be legal rules for interpreting the Constitution, and that might, might tell us something. Um, so I just wanted to sort of start, start talking about that. And Farah, if, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot for just a second, uh, part of my inspiration for doing this was a article, your, an article you have coming out in the Yale Law Journal that was sort of one of the most mind-blowing things I've read in a long time when I picked it up, uh, called Expounding the Constitution, which I guess uncovers that there was a bunch of law for interpreting the Constitution, uh, for interpreting things in general back at the founding that somehow people don't know about anymore. So do you mind just telling us what you found and how you found it? <laughs> Sure. Uh, well, I was reading some early Supreme Court cases, you know, the major hits of the Marshall Court, including McCullough v. Maryland for an event at Georgetown uh, celebrating its bicentennial. And as I was reading through it, I realized all of these arguments and counter arguments about how to interpret the Constitution are incredibly familiar. They sound in the same kinds of arguments that people made at that time about interpreting statutes. Um, as I read uh, more cases with this kernel of an idea in mind, I saw that indeed the same conventions of interpretation that would form the basis of arguments over other kinds of public law uh, were in the toolkit 
of lawyers arguing over the Constitution in the early 19th century and late 18th century, and that this really hadn't been talked about. So that's what the paper is about. It reveals that there was a law of interpretation at the founding, um, and that one of the major arguments of the early national period was which of those laws of interpretation applies to this newfangled thing, a written federal constitution. Yeah, and I should say, I'm, I'm starting asking these questions, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping everybody will sort of jump in and, and we'll just talk, uh, but, but I have many questions. So Steve, does this, does this surprise you? Did... No, I, 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 I'm glad to, glad to hear it. I think that it <laughs> confirms you know, additional things that, that were suggested by the early literature, but I think turns up a lot of really important new um, discoveries on what they thought this new constitution was doing. I think one problem that modern day constitutional interpretation has had is that, um, to use a metaphor that might be familiar to a Chicago crowd, um, it, it treats the constitution like manna from heaven. Um, it treats it just something that plopped in our laps. And what are we to make of this new document? And we have absolutely no idea. So if we have no idea, we might as well make the constitution the best that it can be. And I think one of the things that we learn when we look at the history is that in fact, the constitution is not just sort of dropped down from heaven, it's actually the product of a real enactment process, the product of politicking and the product of decision-making. And it was seen as adding something to the existing stock of law. And so if we want to keep applying it today, um, it's useful to know what exactly it did or did not add to that stock. So, but on this manna from heaven problem, I guess, like the, the expounding the constitution and McCulloch make me think of this line that every con law professor is obligated to quote in the course of teaching constitutional law, right? We must never forget that it is a constitution we are expounding. And that, that sounds like John Marshall saying, no, no, this is manna from, manna from heaven. Like it's not, you might think it's a statute, but it's not a statute. You might think it's a contract. It's not a contract. No, it's a constitution. And of course that's like different from all the other things. So. Isn't that him saying, actually, none of the old rules apply? This is just like a, it's a constitution. Or what does that mean? Well, I think that you have to read that in the context of the word constitution. What did the word constitution mean for late 18th century legal thinkers? They had been using this word for hundreds of years. And what it meant was literally how the society is constituted. Um, just because parts of that constitution are now written down, doesn't take it out of the fund of, um, of, of law that has to do with tr tradition, that has to do with the public welfare and with the traditional organization of society. And you know, the way I read that phrase uh, in this paper that's coming out October 1st or so, is that he was entering a bid for a position on what kind of law and therefore what convention of interpretation ought to be applied uh, to that law that the Constitution was. And his bid was, this is as public as it is possible to be. And at the time, a, a public law like public legislation would be interpreted equitably. It would be interpreted broadly. It would be interpreted as sort of setting out the broad outlines that future judges should fill in as needed as new circumstances arise. Um, and, and that's what he was doing in McCullough. And this was this phrase comes at the end of a paragraph in which he's uh, strongly defending that view of its characterization. So, so I, I guess, right, he said, but he says one of these compares it to is a legal code, right? It doesn't admit of the prolixity of a legal code. So that sounds like it's, I, I think that's a statute, right? Or is that, is that also not? Oh. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I took some trouble to figure out exactly what was he talking about. He, he took Tell us. <laughs> Yeah, he took that phrase from the argument of one of the council, um, and it's one of these rare phrases that doesn't repeat a lot uh, in the available records that I, at least that I could search from the 19th century. But those pieces that I did find suggested that what he was talking about was the kind of codification of the private law of a nation, uh, of the law of contracts, the law of property, uh, that other jurisdictions would attempt, you know, France would attempt later, but that no Anglo law jurisdiction had ever attempted. So he was saying, our constitution, like all of our public laws, um, doesn't partake of the prolixity of the code of a system that tries to delimit each detail uh, and, and discuss each detail of the law ahead of time. Instead, we have a kind of law that requires filling in gaps. 
So when he said, this, is not, this does not partake of the pro prolixity of a legal code, he was saying, this is not a detailed law. This, is not, this doesn't partake of the type of uh, detail that uh, foreign jurisdictions might use um, in places that are attempting codification. No, this is a traditional Anglo uh, public law, and that means that it's subject to equitable interpretation. It's, it's interesting to think here of, of Jeremy Bentham's efforts and others to try and codify English law, and they all uh, crashed and burned pretty miserably just because it's very hard to codify an enormous common law tradition and get it right. Um, and I think that, you know, Bentham was very unhappy about the way that every new statute that was enacted, he said it was like pouring water into the sea. You have no idea what parts of the law it's going to affect and might affect it. Um, and I think that that's very much the common law tradition, that you have statutes, they're additions to an existing set of law. And if you want to understand them, you have to know what the law was beforehand and what they did to it um, and how they changed it. And I think that the, it's useful to know that the Constitution sort of, you know, can't be expected to specify in the, in the nth degree. It doesn't mean that it doesn't specify some things. Um, it doesn't mean that there's not an awful lot of content there, just as there is in the standard, uh, you know, Anglo-American public law. Um, but that, uh, you know, we should not be surprised that it requires a good deal of legal reasoning sometimes to figure out. Yes, and also I think that um, it's uncontroversial uh, to say that many of the great jurists of that time didn't think that the Constitution described all of the fundamental law of the new nation. Um, I remember in uh, Chancellor Kent's opinion that was appealed in Gibbons v. Ogden and, and reversed, he discusses the several different sources of fundamental law, including um, something that might be generalized as natural law if we're looking back at it from, from this day. But at that time, it would have been considered something just like the unwritten constitutional law that they entered into the early national period with. Things like, no man should be a judge of his own cause. That principle didn't get into the written constitution, but there's no question that they thought that it was fundamental in some way and would have uh, relied upon it in interpreting a legal document going forward. So when did this transition from a constitution that writes down some of the fundamental law to our new imagination that the constitution is everything, and if it's not written down there, um, then we, we, we can go nowhere else, we have no other recourse. That transition certainly hadn't happened um, by the early 19th century. So uh, this is taking me away from something, but I'm too fascinated to stop. So, so this sounds like it's, you're saying this, not just that there was a law of interpreting the constitution, but there was like extra quasi-constitutional law or maybe con unwritten constitutional law, like substantive rules also hang, hanging around there. Would they have worked the same way? Like, could a judge strike down an act of Congress on the grounds that it, you know, didn't didn't contradict a provision of the written constitution, but contradicted, you know, the principle that no man should be judged in his own case? Or so or... this was a this was a heated discussion. You can read about it in Calder v. Bull, for example, right? Yeah. Um, you have these these um, opinions going back and forth about well. How can we know whether um, it's okay for a legislature to strike down a, a legal ruling of a lower court? Um, how do we know what is essentially legislative? Um, you know, right. In one sentence for people in the audience, Calder v. Bull is? Ah, Calder v. Bull was a um, 1793, I think, Supreme Court case uh, that dealt with, um, gosh, one sentence. Uh, a, a, um, a disappointed litigant had appealed to the Supreme Court after their positive ruling in a probate case was reversed by, I think it was the Connecticut legislature. Yeah. And their, um, their claim was, this is an ex post facto law. They passed a law that undermined our legal, um, you know, our legal claim. Um, and so the Constitution says, you know, states can't pass ex post facto laws. And so one question is like, well, technically, what does that mean? Does that apply to this? Or does it only, as we now say, as the court says in Calder versus Bull, is that only criminal law? Right. Right. And but in the other question, a previous question was, well, um, is this even a law? And how can we tell? Is it possible for a legislature to be a court of appeal? Um, what sources of law do we have to decide what tripartite government requires in a state 
or in any government. And so there was this sort of heated discussion about, well, do we have um, eternal principles that apply to the situation? Is there some sort of natural law answer to this? Um, do we only have what's written down or do we have to go to custom? Uh, how do we decide what to decide here? And I think the answer that ex post facto is only criminal was the easy dodge of a sort of nest of interesting questions that could have been answered in that case. But, the, but does, doesn't the court therefore implicitly say, no, there's no natural law here. We're not, you know, if it's, if it's not banned by the constitution, we're not gonna get into the business of enforcing, of deciding what is a law or, or any of this natural law stuff or? Well, there's seriatim opinions. What does the court say? I think you have to reduce it to its holding, right? Yeah. We have no idea what their outcome was on the question of whether natural law stands or falls. Um, they, I think, agreed to disagree. So, and you certainly see voices like Judge Iredell who say like, no, you know, if the legislature reached this answer, we can't upset it as, a, as a, an argument from natural justice. But you also see, do, you also do see sort of relatively, uh, you know, well-distributed views about pre-existing common law rules that the constitution might not have upset. So it's not necessarily that there are rules that are super constitutional or sort of of constitutional stature but rules that help us figure out what kind of legislative powers the Constitution did or didn't recognize. So a good example would be the rule that a legislature, Congress, for instance, can't make its laws unamendable. Um, you know, in, in DC and, and forts and arsenals, they can pass exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever. So you would think that that would mean they can do anything that the legislature can conceivably do. But at the time, that would not have been thought to confer a power to make your laws unamendable. Um, the, the common law rule against that was sufficiently strong that nobody would have thought that that uh, power was conferred on Congress. Um, and so I think that's an example where, yes, if Congress did try to say, here's our law for DC, the tax rate is 10% and it can never be any more than that and no future Congress can amend this, you would have a court, if a future Congress did try and amend it, strike down the earlier part of the statute saying, um, this is just not among the legislative powers that was given to Congress. And we know that not because they had a specific exclusion for it, but because the kind of general conferral that they made would not have been thought to confer this power. Um, right. that this was sort of left out. And to the question of whether these are background common law rules that we can draw upon to help us understand how they understood their super law, the constitution, or whether there were um, sort of concurrent constitutions, um, some of which were overlapping and died out. Um, I, I think that it's important to sort of put ourselves in their shoes and think, well, if I had grown up my whole life under one type of constitution, could I change my entire way of being overnight and start arguing um, in courts of law as though that old way of thinking about the constitution, all the vocabulary I applied to it no longer applied? Or would there be a transition period in which people were a little bit unsure um, how fundamental is this old rule that I used to think of as reliably fundamental when comparing to any statutory law? Um, how does that compare to the written constitution? Um, so uh, I think that there may have been a little bit less uh, security, you know, intellectual security about the question of what is fundamental law, especially right after the um, ratification of the constitution. So, so to oh, vastly oversimplify a dialogue between Hamilton and Brutus, right? When they're when they're debating, has have the federal judges been given too much power, and what's going to happen here? You know, Hamilton and the Federalist, and Brutus and the, his responses, right? One of Brutus's fears is equitable interpretation. He says, "Look, the federal courts have jurisdiction and equity, and they're going to get their hands on this constitution, and you know who knows what they're going to do with it? Like equitable courts can do all sorts of crazy stuff, so there's just no telling." what kind of principles they're gonna pour into this document, even if the text looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. And one of Hamilton's responses is, no, no, that wouldn't happen, right? Judges are gonna be bound down by strict rules and precedents. They're not gonna make up crazy stuff, like it's all. So am I, am I hearing, Steve, are you, am I hearing you echoing the Hamiltonian side? Like these are well-established common law rules that judges aren't supposed to get too crazy. And, and Farah, are you taking the Brutus side that really there's, there's less security than nothing you think, or? Well, you know, I don't think that's exactly what Hamilton said. Okay, good. Uh, he, he said, um, there is nothing in the Constitution that directly empowers judges to, uh, to judge this document by equity. They will have no more latitude in doing that than the, your other judges, right? So, okay. you know, it's, it's, it's really, you could read it as a rhetorical dodge. Uh, 
He is a very good and practicing lawyer who has argued for equitable interpretations of public legislation in many of his cases. He knows what it means to empower judges to do no more than what they can do in other cases. It's a lot. Um, it, it doesn't defeat uh, Brutus's, um, Brutus's worry except rhetorically. And I, I would never, never shy away from the label of Hamiltonian on, on this, but um, you know, I, I think that uh, you know, I, I think I, I think that's generally right. He's saying, you know, look, they got all the usual powers, um, but part of what he's saying is, don't be too scared of that because you've lived with that in lots of other contexts. Um, and you know, I think there is this implicit: the usual powers are not all that crazy, uh, sort of message. Yeah. So I guess so. Uh... Well, you probably both anticipate this theme coming. So are things different today? Like are the things that judges do to the constitution now more or less in line with what would have been called equitable interpretation then? Or is there a difference between all the, I'll say crazy stuff judges do to the constitution now? Uh, yeah, are we still living under the same principles or, or not? Hi there, you. Yeah. So, so I, I'd say that we are, certainly in the sense that the judges, you know, appeal for their authority to the same uh, sources that they would have appealed to then. Um, so, you know, whether the justices in practice are doing what they ought to is one question. Um, whether they, in theory, are claiming more authority than they used to have, I don't think so. So I don't think that uh, any Supreme Court opinion explicitly claims more authority than the J Court would have had they might make incorrect historical claims about how much authority the J court had. Um, but I think that they see themselves as sort of bound down by, um, you know, what the original arrangements were, unless something else has happened legally to change that. Uh, I'm not sure that necessarily it has. Uh, so I think that the rhetoric does share um, a lot over the ages. And I think that's important um, as uh, cosmetic as it may be, um, using the same terms, the same phrases, the same style of argumentation helps encourage um, faith in the legitimacy of the outcomes um, and connects us over time with the past. So I'm not saying this is nothing, but I, I tend to think that there, a lot has changed. Um, even the, uh, the referral to the past, you know, um, originalism as it exists at the Supreme Court today, uh, I think it's hard to compare to any originalist-like statements that you might see in the court uh, only 10 years or 20 years after the Constitutional Convention. They may have referred to uh, ideas about what was intended or, or what that might have meant, um, but is that really doing the same thing um, as referring back 200 years when one of the sort of basic values in um, English and American law has always been that we cannot surprise litigants with, um, with outcomes that they couldn't have anticipated from basically the last 30 years of development of precedent. So, for instance, we're not quite sure exactly how fundamentalist, originalist the current Supreme Court may become. But say uh, they were, uh, you know, faced with a, um, a new question of constitutional interpretation and um, an amicus brief shows them that a new trove of documents from, you know, the Madisonian collection has come to light. It has, you know, minutes um, taken down in excruciating detail that show that something that for the past 200 years we had consistently interpreted one way is actually a completely different thing. Suddenly that upsets 200 years of precedent and it surprises everyone. Um, that I, I just, I cannot believe that the judges of, um, of early America, uh, who, um, aside from their revolution, were largely committed conservatives, um, uh, as most successful lawyers and judges are, and that is the conservative in the sense that they want to conserve traditional ways of doing things rather than uh, completely abandon the old ways. I'm, I'm not sure that that would have been in keeping with the way they would have um, adjudged a case. I think that may be right, but I think that it's sort of hard to draw the analogy because um, 
they didn't necessarily have written sources of law that would have required that kind of treatment. Yeah. So, I mean, it's possible that you could imagine, I mean, certainly, you know, you have Madison talking about, you know, the ancient phraseology of the law. You could imagine someone saying, hey, this statute from 1580 that you need, that, you know, has traditionally been applied, turns out we've just been reading it wrong for the last hundred years. And for the first hundred years of its existence, it meant something very different. Um, and, you know, what would they do with that? And, you know, there are discussions of, of reliance and of, uh, you know, started decisis around the time of the founding. But if the explicit source is something that's really, really old, um, there would certainly have been a lot of resources in their tradition to say, you know, gosh, the, it has whatever, you know, content it had when it was adopted. Um, you know, there might be common law rules that have grown up around it since, but if we're trying to apply the statute, we have to apply the statute. Um, I think that the, the, dif the difference in their attitude toward the Constitution today and the difference in the, in, or, sorry, back then as opposed to the job that a justice has today is that it was easier for them to make, you know, as Marshall often did, sort of unsourced pronouncements as to, you know, of course, this is what that meant. Um, you know, to the extent that it's more in living memory, it's just easier to do that. Um, when you actually have to do some work to to justify, you know, your statements of, oh, the Constitution clearly meant X or clearly meant Y, um, your attitude towards it is going to be very different. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not sure that it's because the source of the information was in living memory that um, Marshall had an easier time of it. I mean, he was present at the um, ratification convention in Virginia, and um, he spoke there, and he made arguments about what the constitution would mean that would later be, you know, about, and that, that represent an about face for him, for the, the kinds of rulings he made about the meaning of the constitution when he was a Supreme Court justice. It wasn't because he couldn't remember. It's because he was more pragmatic. You know, the, the, um, uh, the hallmark of early constitutional interpretation is uh, pragmatism. And to the extent that they had these arguments over interpretive uh, principles, um, these were proxy battles about their um, preferred policies in many cases. They were not just sort of pure questions of theory or, or philosophy or law. Um, it was really about what kind of country do we want to live in? What kind of powers do we want this government to have? And how do we get there? Um, so I, I think that there has been a, a um, we, we have barnacles on the hull now of um, theories of interpretation that can sometimes blind people uh, to you know, discussions of the pragmatic effects of their rulings um, in ways that I don't think that that founding generation would have recognized. So we may, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it may be, though, that their theories are more binding on us than, than their pragmatic choices. I mean, no one would say that sort of the Georgia legislature to honor the wishes of the founders should be, all be bribed by the Yazoo Land Company. Um, you know, the, the, what comes from the past that's still binding on us today are, to some extent, the, the legal rules that they thought were in place. And they may have made their arguments for one legal rule or another based on their pragmatism. But that's a, that may be a different picture than pragmatism itself being an element of the legal rule as in certain cases it was. How much more um, useful might it be though if we were to um, have a fulsome sense of what were the politics surrounding that the, the, the decision in Fletcher v. Peck? What were all of the disparate strands of considerations that went into that opinion? Uh, what were they considering? What, what policies and interest groups were they balancing? Then we would have more than just the can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Then we would have more than just sort of the, the naked phrasing, the, the way that they've dressed it up um, for the written opinion. We would also have the rationale um, and we could um, change the nice phrasing um, to follow the rationale if we still agree with it. So that's one thing, I mean, we talked earlier a little bit about this sort of rhetoric versus practice question for modern judges. And I was wondering about that for Marshall. Like, it seems like it's right. Like, uh, when it comes to sovereign immunity, Marshall said a bunch of stuff about sovereign immunity at the Virginia Ratifying Convention that would have been very comforting to the states. And then writes cases like Coens versus Virginia, where he acts like he has no idea what he said at the Virginia Ratifying Convention and doesn't mention it. And I take the point that's pragmatic. But 
he doesn't tell us that's what he's doing, right? He doesn't say, oh, sure, like I said that to get the constitution ratified, but now, you know, <laughs> now here we are. Uh, he doesn't say like, this is really a political battle. So, well, uh, yeah. you know, it may not have been, right? It, it, it may be just that like all um, great intellectuals, he changed his mind over time as he had more experience and, um, and uh, more experience and became a better lawyer. Yeah. Uh, as he grew into a position of power, the experience of being in power changed his view about his responsibilities and about the responsibilities of government. So uh, I think that his feeling of freedom to change his mind and not excuse himself um, is another one of those things that we could learn from him um, if, we allowed to, if we allowed ourselves to learn from all the context and not just the holdings um, of, of these early Supreme Court opinions. So the, the more cynical version of that would be when he was trying to get people to give him power or to create a fed, powerful federal government, he had a narrow view of federal power. And then once he got some, he, like many people in power, discovered that power made a lot of sense and that he should have lots of it. Well, it couldn't just be that because he was also just simply wrong about things, right? He, um, <laughs> he called Chisholm v. Georgia wrong. In that, in that uh, convention speech, he stood up and said, no one would ever hail a sovereign state into court. That's ridiculous. No one would stand for it. Again, recognize that this was not written down in the Constitution anywhere. It was just his view of what the background norms were, um, what the, the unwritten constitutional norms were that would definitely still apply um, in the new regime. Uh, he was just wrong about that. He might have been wrong about a lot of things. And the experience of being wrong uh, certainly changes at least uh, sort of sensible, intelligent, uh, humble people. And I think it changed him. So I, I would never speak against having additional context in order to understand um, you know, what the law was at a historical time. But it's hard because you know, only some of the facts about that time generate law. Um, there are lots of things that people do today um, that we, you know, even people in power do today that we don't think are sort of the best reflection of our legal rules. Um, and, you know, whether Marshall was right or wrong when he spoke in the convention, I, I, I happen to think he was more correct um, in the convention than, than later on. Um, but it's hard to know, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know which direction to read all of the pragmatics. I mean, we should remember, you know, Lord Acton's dictum was not power makes one a better lawyer. Um, and there is a um, difficulty in reconstructing any period of the past, which I think is, is a really serious one and that people who want to do serious constitutional interpretation need to treat gingerly. Um, you know, it's very easy to get sort of out over our skis in terms of, uh, you know, making, uh, uh, you know, our own consonant pronouncements. And so as someone who identifies as an originalist, like I would definitely say, this is a, a problem endemic to the field. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, there are some areas where it's possible to make, you know, better and worse arguments. We, you know, people dispute something at the time, Hamilton and Madison, you know, go at it hammer and tongs. It's possible to say that one of them had the better argument. Um, and those, the, the strength of the argument may or may not depend either on the pragmatics at the time or the pragmatics now, or the, uh, you know, degree to which we, we like the result. Right. Well, that's certainly true. And I think the danger comes in pretend in um, some people, obviously not you, but some people pretending as though there were no arguments to be had about these issues. You know, that acknowledging at the very least that there were ongoing discussions about most of the issues that may come up um, today uh, that were at least relevant back then um, is an important sort of point of um, tension. I think, in, in any originalist opinion, because then you have not only to say that you are following the, the path laid down by our forefathers, but also to say why you're following um, the better lit path and, and not the side paths that others of our forefathers took. So I'm going to hopefully open this up to questions shortly. So if anybody has any, please uh, raise your little blue hand or you can put it in the chat instead if you want. Uh, first, I'm going to put on a persona or ask a question wearing my textualist hat, right? So, so uh, after all of this, uh, the Patrick Henrys of the world might get a little suspicious and might say, "Do we re does the Constitution really need interpreting? It seems like all this interpreting is just getting us into trouble, right? It's just creating lots and lots of different possibilities for people to argue over, letting them pour in their politics. 
we just read it. You know, it's a document, it's written down, you should just read it. And, and all of this kind of extra stuff that's not written there, that only fancy lawyers know, is just gonna make it undemocratic and be a way that judges can surprise people and pull all their tricks. So, so I don't know, what, do we really, you know, do we really need all this stuff or can we just, can we just read the darn thing and, and stop with all the interpreting? So I, I can uh, jump in first if you like. So, so I think that, um, you know, part of the, uh, there, there was certainly an attraction to that and, and Saul Cornell and others have demonstrated, you know, that there were a bunch of folks who, who thought that way. Um, I think what's interesting is that they tended not to be lawyers or uh, tended not to be sort of super embedded in the legal community um, in that, uh, you know, the, the, if you treat this object as a legal instrument, it might have some legal rules of interpretation that are going to apply to it. If you treat it as sort of the voice of the people, sort of unmediated, um, you know, straight from the people of the United States to the government, um, then there might be more of an argument for, um, you know, just reading it as the way that, the, you know, the, the man in the street would have read it. Um, I think that that's kind of tough, though, because um, you know, it was something that was commented on. It was something that was that was interpreted that couldn't do without interpretation. Um, and I think the better reading of the of the histories that was seen as something that was an entry in a in a legal environment, um, not just some sort of um, extraordinary lightning bolt from the people that um, you know required no uh, uh, careful study in order to get its meaning. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I also, I mean, this reminds me of um, an argument you might hear. Um, you know, I know that, um, uh, um, I don't know, Tennyson was a poet, but I don't hold with all this um, English literature stuff. I'm just going to read the words and what's there is there. Yeah. And that's what it means. You know, if you, if you have a document written by lawyers, um, there's going to be some lawyerly interpretation required um, before you can understand exactly what they meant. Um, and that's true of, it, it's, it's an unfortunate thing about a legal training that um, it can make people forget how to write in plain prose, uh, but it's not one that we can avoid. And I don't think that it's, um, I don't think it is avoidable, especially for this generation of, um, of young, um, ambitious, um, intellectually fervent people who delighted in complex ideas and, and who intentionally put um, legal terms of art into the work that they completed at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, so I, I think that some interpretation is required. Um, otherwise, uh, to read it straight is to read it incompletely. Um, and, and I'm not sure that that does anyone any favors given how much uh, it's intended to describe. So, but should we see that at least as a little bit of a defect? Like again, they're intentionally putting in legal terms of art, then running out to the people to get this ratified as if that was important. When the people have no way of knowing what's, what's hidden in all these terms of art, right? They sign off on the thing, being told by the lawyers, like we wrote this for you, promised it's all good. And then later the lawyers show up and say, oh, actually you signed away, you know, your sovereignty or whatever. And that was something that people at these conventions really worried about. There was this wonderful quote that you can find in the, um, uh, in the convention records, the ratification convention records from Massachusetts, where a farmer raises his hand and says, um, you fancy lawyers have made this thing. You're trying to get us to swallow it down like a pill, and then you'll swallow us up just like the, the whales uh, swallowed uh, <laughs> Jonah. <laughs> Jonah. <laughs> And, you know, so this was an accusation that was abroad. Um, and it was something that people were keenly aware of and worried about. Um, I, I think that the reaction uh, to that accusation was to try to rush conventions, to limit participation, to r issue reassurances that may or may not have borne out and, and the interpretations that those same people later put on the document. Um, and other things. It wasn't to decomplexify the document itself. I mean, certainly the experience of, you know, making a will or, or buying a house um, is one where you have a lawyer telling you about what this instrument will do and you really hope that they're right. 
Um, and sometimes constitution making is like that too. It's very hard to talk about what it means for no attainder of treason to work corruption of blood without either speaking at very great length or you know, sometimes getting it wrong. I mean, if you try and translate the legal words into other words, just like with uh, you know, reading a, a, a book originally written in French, you know, it's not necessarily going to capture it quite the right way. So there are some real advantages um, when you want to um, do something legally to be able to rely on legalese. All right, we have a question from Adam Griffin. I'm gonna to try to unmute. Hey, Professor Sachs, Professor Bowd, and Professor Peterson. That was a really great conversation. I appreciate you doing this event today. My question was, you had all talked about um, the Hamilton Brutus debate and like Hamilton's view that judges were just kind of being judges and would have all the power of judges. So did the founders think federal judges had any more or less different or just the same power that a state court judge has? Was there any difference in the understanding of their responsibilities and their judicial power? Um, so I'll, I guess I can start. Um, the question of what federal judges would be able to do is one of those um, questions that divided the Constitutional Convention and that they put off deciding until the meeting of the first Congress. It then um, created a really heated debate in Congress um, as many states were worried about outposts of federal power uh, within their states, worried about what they were before, worried that um, you know, all the law that was needed was done perfectly fine by the state courts. So when you say that you're gonna put a federal court in my jurisdiction, what exactly are you doing that for? This is sort of the sensibility of many of these um, skeptical comments. Um, the first Judiciary Act created a federal judiciary of very circumscribed powers. Uh, but that's a different, there are two different elements to your question, right? Um, could federal judges do the same things that state court judges did? No, because their power was defined by Congress, and Congress defined that power very narrowly at first. There was no federal question jurisdiction until after the Civil War. The other question, though, is, was a federal judge the same thing as a state judge, just with smaller jurisdiction? And that, I think, is uh, maybe a more interesting question. And, and I tend to think that the answer is yes, um, that they thought that the office of the judge um, and all of the implied powers of the judge, the ability to um, issue different writs, for example, although Marbury v. Madison was um, going in the opposite direction here, but um, the, the power to issue different kinds of writs, the power to, to think and sound in equity as well as law, um, the responsibility to the bar uh, that they inherited from their Anglo from, from English law heritage. Um, I do think that they thought they were creating that kind of office. And another um, way of, of framing the question is what exactly were state judges allowed to do? Um, so it might well be that some state judges had broader responsibilities that the federal judges didn't think in a regime with the Constitution's particular separation of powers um, they could exercise. So maybe, maybe Habern's case is really sort of a dispute about that, about you know, to what extent can federal judges play a role in, in executive administration um, in a way that maybe some state judges under their constitutional arrangements would be able to do. Um, certainly there was a sense of sort of default rules um, as opposed to what was, what was specific to any one state. But I think also, you know, nowadays when we think about state judges, a lot of it has to do with the common law. And there's this image of state judges as sort of um, crusading, common law creators and as that being sort of part of their remit. Um, and I'm not honestly sure that that was in fact the vision of state judges around the time of the founding. Um, I think that certainly the, uh, you know, certainly the kind of freewheelingness that we see in somebody like, you know, Mansfield or, um, you know, w w w was, was sort of raised some eyebrows at the time um, and uh, whether that was seen as the proper role of a judge, then it might be different from what the answer is now. So it could well be that, you know, we shouldn't assume that, that state judges are quite as powerful as we now think them to be. Yeah. I mean, my research indicates that um, 
some state judges, depending on, um, depending on the jurisdiction, um, were that powerful and more. And I think there's a wonderful book by Richard, by, uh, Richard Ellis um, called the, the Jeffersonian Crisis that chronicles a national debate over judicial power um, where, you know, the Jeffersonians who were very skeptical of Mansfield and his style of judicial, um, um, of, of the judicial role, um, it declined to elect lawyers to the bench in some states, wanted to make sure that the law was accessible, um, were angrily opposed to anything looking like judicial review or even the use of foreign law or foreign languages and judicial opinions. Whereas other um, older jurisdictions, jurisdictions where judges were shielded from the interplay of national politics, like in New York, um, even North Carolina, Judge Ruffin, you see um, the, uh, a very expansive style of early American judging. Uh, uh, Chancellor Kent is a classic example of a very Mansfield type American judge. So one, I mean, one obvious theme I'm hearing here, probably obvious to you too, but maybe not to all those students, is uh, the Erie, the Erie versus Tompkins, the Erie, 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 the Erie Railroad rule that state courts can do all sorts of crazy common law crusading, and federal courts are supposed to be kind of potted plants as far as the common law is concerned. That distinction wasn't necessarily the same there. Now maybe we have a dispute about are they all crusaders or are they all potted plants or something in between, but the idea that there was a sharp difference between two different kinds of judge, it's not the way, not the way it was back in the day, right? Well, I think there were judges who agreed with Jefferson, sometimes self-consciously to find themselves as Jeffersonian Republicans mm -hmm. and um, intentionally limited themselves to a very narrow uh, ambit of, of authority or, or um, discretion, a narrow ambit of discretion. Other judges who, um, who thought of themselves more as Hamiltonian, uh, who revered him as the father of Federalist jurisprudence um, and who revered Mansfield um, and who saw their role as very broad as this kind of statecraft. And so it's hard to generalize about this era because th this was a source of disagreement along with the other things we've been talking about. Yeah. All right, so I have a question here in the chat also uh, from a, all right, it says, my question is, if the constitution ought to be interpreted in light of equitable principles and pragmatism, uh, what are the limiting principles, if any? Does originalist interpretation collapse into whatever shall be, shall be? so long as it is presented in originalist terms? It should, should I, go ahead, Steve. Oh, so, so my initial uh, comment was going to be, you know, exactly how broad equitable interpretation went, you know, is not um, uncontested and wasn't uncontested at the founding. So I'm thinking about examples like, you know, you have a statute and it refers to um, you know, purchasers or something. Well, does it also ex extend to executors and administrators of the estates of purchasers if the purchaser themselves is dead and, you know, the executor is showing up in court? And courts might say, yes, you know, that's outside the language, but we're going to, um, you know, we, we will equitably read that in. Or, you know, Samuel Thorne has a great example of a really old statute that referred to the theft of horses. Does it apply to the theft of one horse? Um, and, you know, to, to what extent, you know, the, 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 the idea of departure from the strict words can mean a lot of different things. Um, and I think that Sam Bray's recent article on the mischief rule is very helpful in articulating that the, um, the range of options, once you say, look, we're gonna try and figure out what the statute was doing and why it was being put in, and um, as opposed to, we're going to figure out sort of what are all of the goals that the statute makers might have had and how will we forward those goals to the maximum extent today. These are not necessarily sort of one position. So I think that it is perfectly possible to say, look, courts all the time interpret, um, you know, First Amendment rights of speech and press to apply to email, not because it constitutes a speech or a printing press, but because we understand what the right of uh, free opinion might have referred to back then, and this is how it would most sensibly apply today. 
without saying that sort of it's open season. Um, I think that there's a there's a danger of in, of inferring that sort of any um, attempt to apply the word sensibly results in a complete absence of constraint. Um, I also think it's um, dangerous uh, for the discipline of history to tie very strongly uh, what we do today to what we may or may not find in the record. Um, it may be that there were some out of control, wild and crazy early American judges, um, even important ones, um, that would have gone to the full extent of their intuition about what the law should do, regardless of what the text says. It doesn't necessarily mean that judges today should do that. Um, in, in this, I, of course, depart from the originalist position. I'm not an originalist myself, uh, but I, I think that um, to, to take from a discovery that early American judges would be bad judges today, that we should be bad judges today, is to go too far. So how should we decide what judges today should do? Or what should judges today do? Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, I don't think it's an easy question. Um, I don't think it's easy for any gener generation. I think it has a, a mix. It, uh, these, um, these classic values of fairness, openness um, of, um, again, not surprising litigants with um, revolu sudden revolutions in the law. Um, these kinds of principles that we can learn from in the past uh, continue to be relevant, but how exactly you apply them and what mix, what you emphasize in each individual case, um, I think is probably you can't escape from a pr pragmatic decision about the justice due to the individuals before the court. Um, and I know that's not as neat an answer as, well, let's go to our pattern book. We've looked it up. Uh, here we go. Here's the answer. Uh, but I really don't believe that there is a pat answer um, to these difficult questions. And Steve, do you agree that if there are bad judges back then, we should be bad judges now? <laughs> Uh, I don't think we should be bad judges, but I, I think our sense of, you know, what the judicial office is and what powers were conferred is very important. So if, for instance, um, you know, the, the judge's office was one that had certain powers attached to it and those powers have never been taken away, um, it would be hard to say why in a given case if the judiciary thinks that, um, you know, the, a certain result should, should uh, follow that it would be unable to do that. Um, I think it would make it would be extremely important knowing what the powers really were, um, because obviously there's a temptation in judges to exaggerate them. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that it's not very easy to say why, you know, just like if, if Congress had a certain power at the time of the founding and hasn't lost it, um, you know, that it's never been lawfully taken away, why they should be unable to exercise it today if they've, if they've got the votes for it. Um, I think that, that we can have arguments about what the best model of judging would be. Um, but if we're trying to say that judges have legal reason not to do something that they would otherwise be empowered and inclined to do, the question is, okay, well, what makes that a legal reason? Not just a sort of, this is, this is a bad way to do judging reason. Mm -hmm. um, and that works in both directions. You know, it could be that judges were more hemmed in in certain ways um, than they think themselves today. Um, and then we'd have to say, well, well you know, even if we think it, the, the current re regime to be better as a matter of political theory, what makes it the legal regime? You know, I think that um, it's, it's possible to think of these powers as having fallen into desuetude, that the question of exactly what powers each branch has um, might be vulnerable to the same kind of answer as other kinds of the common, of, of sort of common law question. Uh, which is, uh, you know, if you haven't used this part of your lawn for a long time, if you let someone else build a fence on it, um, after a certain amount of time, uh, you cannot just go bulldoze that fence and not expect um, to pay for it, you know? So uh, you, you could imagine different, quote unquote, legal ways of answering this question that depart from the framers, the founders, the early national periods view of, of um, the way power is organized. Right, but I take it, so similarly, right, the, the fence is adverse possession from property law, and then there are different rules in different jurisdictions about when you get to bulldoze it, right? And in some places it has to be 20 years, and in some places, actually, if you've 
uh, gave them a note saying defense is okay, then you can do it for a long time. But so then it's sort of law all the way down. Well, that's true, but that just means you can't get away from interpretation. Um, it, but while you can't get away from interpretation, there are legal principles on the other side. There are legal principles yeah. that say, well, you know, an early American judge could decide that by necessary and proper, they meant necessary, proper, and convenient. They did decide that, and that's what we're stuck with because we've gone 200 years without knocking that fence down. Um, or you could decide to be a Jeffersonian about it and say, well, you know, uh, they don't ha list any federal crimes in the Constitution except treason and bribery. So we can't have a federal criminal code. Sorry, all of these cases have to be overturned. It's, uh, you know, there, there are sort of legal answers on both sides of the question uh, that taken too far can become ridiculous. That, that, that Jefferson argument is actually on my research agenda to try to write, but uh, I need to be a little bit uh, more drunk before it totally makes sense. Uh, all right, the time is ticking down on us, so I'm gonna uh, call it. This has been a delightfully rich conversation, so I'm really glad you guys could could join us, and I hope everybody learned something from it. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for the invitation.